Welcome to the Math Ed Podcast. My name is Sam Otten from the University of Missouri, and joining me today is a brand new doctor. It's Dr. Michael Little Crow, who just received his uh, PhD from Arizona State University, and he's on the faculty in the Math and Stats Department at Arizona State. Mike, thanks so much for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to talk to Mike a little bit about his dissertation study, which not only involves some innovative methodologies, but it also involves podcasting. So so this is going to be fun to talk to another podcaster and uh, be curious to see how podcasting fit into your dissertation study. But that study was called Professional Development for Math Educators Podcast, Amplifying, Hearing, and Understanding the Voice of Community Educators. But Mike, before we get into the details of that dissertation study, I also do want to ask you how you came to grad school or what brought you into doctoral study? Well, I had looked for a, a graduate program for, for a while. When I was back at Oregon State, I started doing some graduate work, thought I would get a, a doctorate at that time at Oregon State. It just didn't work out. Only got a few classes under my belt. So the way this time it worked out was my wife was looking for a program. She did her master's in interdisciplinary studies, and her focus was on using mindfulness to reduce stress in teachers. And she found this program at Arizona State University. She found one within the Mary Lou Fulton College of Education, a teacher's college. It was a it's a very interdisciplinary study in educational leadership and innovation. And I think that was what I, what helped me understand was I wasn't really doing math ed type research. I was doing more methods research and ways of reaching students that would help math educators, but I needed a broader field to look at. And so as she went through her program, I worked with her. I read the same stuff she was reading basically to see if I'd be able to work full time and do it. Uh, And as she finished up, she said, now it's your turn. So uh, that's how I I came into this particular program. It's actually an educational doctorate in uh, leadership and innovation. Yeah. And some of your innovations have to do with combining indigenous oral research methods, but then also bringing podcasting into it. So I was wondering, how did you come up with this idea to combine the indigenous oral research methods with podcasting? And how did that sort of take shape as a source of data for this study? It was really um, sort of backwards. It was the mentors I had, my, my committee chair and the, one of the members on my committee. So my chair was uh, Dr. Andrea uh, Weinberg. And I also had Dr. Leah Wolf, uh, who I would had classes with. And they both together helped me. Dr. Leah Wolf had done some experimenting with alternate methods. And so she was the one that Actually, early on in, in a class I was taking, suggested I do a podcast as a, and it was a short one on a project, and it it went well. So she she liked that. And then as I'm doing my dissertation research, trying to develop it, I kept trying to fit it in that I would do one of the classes I taught, and it was so hard because it's hard for me to really plan out and do a class until I meet my students. But to do research on it, you actually have to at least a semester in advance, right? And a lot of times I don't know exactly which classes I'm going to be teaching in a given semester. So it was one of these things where it was, I'd get things sort of ready. And then by the time the class hit, it it wasn't right. And so I was just chatting with my chair about this side project I had been doing, which we'll go into a little more detail called the fire circles. And it was something we had already done and she was suggesting I do that as my research. I said, well, it's already done and I don't have IRB approval. I, you know, how can I do that? She goes, well, you can use the the professional development as background information and maybe do something new, maybe some interviews. And then when we brought in our Dr. Wolf, she suggested, well, podcasting would be the way. And so the whole goal from the start was just to have the voice of these educators that we had in the professional development, what did they what did they like about our professional development? What was some of the other things that they had? Uh, what did they find out? And it was while I was doing that, I then started thinking, how am I going to analyze this data? And I know some of our classes, there's, there's software out there that will, you know, count the number of times a word occurs and this and that and kind of quantify the qualitative data. And I was thinking, that's, not quite what I want. I want to find a way, even though I taught statistics and I and I was 
guided all this way that you've got to have quantifiable data. You know, you have to have numbers somehow. That's what people are looking for. What I was looking for was a way to incorporate the story. My background is actually, I'm a, I'm a math educator mostly because I struggled with math and almost dropped out of college because of math. And I had some great professors, one at Portland State University, Dr. Crittenton, who found out the semester I had him that he was dyslexic and his, his way of explaining things. I said, that's exactly you know the way I think. And so he helped me with that. So I wanted something that would tell the story of these math educators. And so I was thinking back to some of the, I guess, training I had. I, I had a relationship with a medicine man from the Northern Cheyenne, Donlin Many Bad Horses. He would conduct sweat lodge with us. He inducted me in and taught me how to be the fire tender, how to do the be, even be a water pourer. And he sanctioned me to, to conduct these ceremonies. He would do what's called a, he called it the village. And it was a three day where we would gather as a community. We would live in tents and uh, we'd do sweat lodges at night. And um, But part of it was he always asked us at the start to think of a question that we wanted an answer to and not to tell anybody, but to think of it in our heart, put it up in the heavens. And then through our conversations with people, not maybe directly, but he says over this three-day period, you will find that answer. And then at the end, he would ask us each what our question was, what were the answers we got. And it always worked that within that three-day time period of these interactions, we got our, our questions answered. And so that's where the indigenous research methods came was I'm thinking I wanted something organic and that's how his training was. He was trained by his grandmother, by his, you know, the generations taught him how to draw people's data out from within them. This, this stories that we have that we carry with us. And I wanted to bring that to, to my work. And it was, it was really difficult because there was, there was no template to follow, but at the same time, that was kind of nice. My mentors throughout the process gave me some feedback, but it was in doing this, I found out it was like the voices. I, I would listen again and again, and all the voices sort of were now in my head, and my head was doing the hard analysis work. I could actually feel things. And so it was involving my emotion, my my intellect, everything within me without going off to some technological box to sort of analyze and count and do things. And so I, I suggested to my chair that maybe I should do both. And she just, it was very nice that she says, well, we'll, we'll putting it through the technology, will that help your research? I said, well, I think at best it would validate it. But it, at the same time, I felt it was also maybe an intrusion into the methods. And she says, well, you don't need to do that for us. She says, "We, you can handle it. And, and so that's where it, it sort of all just organically happened. It, and I had no experience with an alternative dissertation. And again, it was, it was a little scary going into that because part of, you know, a traditional, there's chapter one, two, three, you kind of know what you're supposed to do. And in this one, I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do or where it was going to go or or when I got done, whether it would be you know good enough or would get passing marks on it or not. Uh, so it was very important through this whole process to have such supportive uh, staff on my on my team on the committee. Yeah, that's great to hear that you did have that support to try this out and to go and then a little bit like having that faith that if you take the time and if you de you know dedicate yourself and dive into it then things will emerge by the end. So that's great to hear. And now that you've done it, you can leave this as a model for other people to also think a little bit outside the box, a little bit outside of the norms of like traditional Western European kind of academic dissertation expectations. And it's great that we can be here too to talk a little bit more about it. I, I'm curious if you could say a little bit more about the Fire Circle's professional development, like who who is involved in it and how is that structured in terms of the math education side of that PD? Yeah, that also was was an organic creation that we made. Uh, I believe it was actually Dr. Shaughnessy who recommended me to this group that was putting together a grant, uh, Dr. Velma Mesa from University of Michigan, and Claire and Frank and Beline 
uh, professor from New Mexico, one from Texas. So we we put this grant together where the goal was to do professional development with math educators, and then that would lead to better uh, success rate for students. The grant was seeking better success rate for students, and one of their feedbacks was is they they felt that was too long of a line that they wanted something directly. And we were in a position where we were thinking, no, it, it's it is this long range. You've got to uh, you've got to develop the educators so that they can develop the students. And while we didn't get the grant, we had such good, rich interactions with each other that we decided to keep working together without funding. And so we had we sort of tested it out on ourselves without knowing it. We just said, let's do some reading. Let's do some more reading. And so we did these. And then we had these discussions. We go, wow, we're learning so much from each other uh, because we read these articles, but our discussions are about our experiences. And we said, maybe this is the kind of thing we should do for a professional development. And so we did that for about a year. And then uh, it came up with the idea is the fire circles. I'm Anishinaabe Cree. My people are the Turtle Mountain Chippewa from North Dakota. In my background, I'd seen our people had what called fire circles, and it was a mix of the three different Anishinaabe peoples, the um, the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Ottawa. And those three separate tribes would have certain duties to sort of protect the fire because fire meant life. It was how we cooked. It was how we kept warm. It was an important part. So keeping that fire running, uh, the fire keepers, those were so important. And so it was how these three different bands, I guess we could call them of a same nation, uh, worked together. And, you know, they saw themselves really as separate people, separate nations, but with a similar language and such. So I wanted to uh, bring that kind of thought into what we were doing, that we were asking diverse peoples from various tribes, if you will, whether whether they saw themselves as indigenous or not indigenous, but we wanted to bring them together and we wanted them to, we wanted to find what was the lifeblood, what was that fire in math education that kept each of us going that protected us, that helped our students be successful. It was an organic thing where we would suggest articles. We would read those together for the first session. We'd have discussions. And during those discussions, our participants, but the thing was it was strange is we didn't have a single facilitator. There was the five of us were still in there. We were participants as well as developers. And what was so nice is that our other, we had somewhere between five to seven other participants, new folks to this, there was sort of this trade-off where they became the developers over time. So it was kind of, here's an example of what we're doing. And then now, can you guys suggest us some readings? Would you choose the topic for the next one? So we didn't have four sessions planned out. We we had dates for them. We really only planned the first one. The second one was this collaboration between us and them and by the second one, there was no longer us and them. It was we were just all learners working together, finding some articles to read as a as sort of an outline, and then just having these rich conversations with each other up from our experience. Hmm. And uh, we did it twice. And I think in a couple of weeks, we're going to have another meeting. We're looking at doing another iteration of it. Hmm. And it it's just like that fire kind of grows and it does what is going to do on its own um, and, and keeps, keeps the, the people alive. Yeah. And just real quick, the other five to seven that joined in sort of what, what sort of uh, context are they from or teaching? It was really nice. We had a, a couple graduate students that would join in. A number of them did teach at tribal colleges. Uh, we just recruited out there broadly. And then the, the second time we, we asked those who were participants if they could suggest others and we had, uh, I remember one one of the podcasts that I did was uh, Ivy from, uh, she's a Arapaho uh, nation. She brought a lot of interesting background to her work because she also teaches uh, Arapaho history and language as well as mathematics. So we had those, we had uh, people who did not identify as being indigenous or from an indigenous group. But I think 
part of our discussion was this understanding that we're we're all have indigenous roots. Some of us go back, like on my father's side, I go back to the European. He was Saxon. Two thousand years ago, his people were indigenous. You know, they they lived in a tribal situation. They were colonized by the Romans, and they went through all that. So we all have that in our history. And I think that was the beautiful thing that we really brought out is that we are all indigenous. Just some of us have to look back a couple thousand years instead of a couple hundred years to see that kind of lifestyle. So as part of this dissertation process, you actually produced podcast episodes. Uh, I believe there's five episodes. I wonder if um, you could just let us know what went into those podcast episodes. And if, if we were to go listen to them, like what should we expect to hear in those podcast episodes? For the dissertation, I, I was, you know, I would have liked to get all, I think we had a total of 12, maybe 14 participants. And then I had the developers who I could have called on if need be. So I, I sent out emails and got actually initially four responses, which I thought was good. My my chair said I should have three to five and that it would be a lot of work. So don't try to go for 10, but I would probably be the limit. So I got four responses and then I about, I think I was into a second or third one. I got another response of someone who just, you know, hadn't been checking their email, but they were willing. I said, oh, that'd be great. The fifth one. So I had the same series of questions that I asked each of them about seven or eight questions, but I, I sent them to them and I I got them to think about it. I realized when I started doing the podcast, I tend to think in circles and I, I'm while it's nice having a format during the the conversations, we really, I didn't ask the questions directly, but they had them, I had them, and we we addressed all of the points. But it was nice, some focused on one part or the other, but it was, it sort of naturally, organically developed. So what you will hear about is the lived experience of each of those math educators from within their community, how they interacted with others within their community. Some of them had tribal elders that gave them suggestions. Uh, Some listened to their students. They got teaching experience from listening to their students. And I think that's really where where all the ideas was, is if we listen deeply, and it was kind of like they were teaching me too. They were teaching me how I was going to actually analyze, because I was at this point when I was doing them, I really didn't have the analysis part, I knew I would listen to them. But as they were telling me that that was the key is to listen again and again, and then you and and reflect, listen and reflect. And that's really, it was during the making of the podcasts, that the idea of my teacher is uh, the villages that Donlin would do. That's what he says, that's exactly what he was doing. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to my people here, and I'm going to reflect on what they're saying. And and having five of them was nice because, again, they focused on different aspects. Uh, they had different fields. Some were more STEM-based engineering, some more mathematics, but it was all in there. It just sort of developed. So I think what you'll learn is, is this importance of listening and the importance of the oral traditions and and podcasting was just this perfect platform for it because again, there's no video because sometimes video we we're, we're looking with our eyes and we see and our eyes will override what our ears are hearing sometimes. So with podcasts, only the ears get the information, and so then you've got to that brings us more into relationality with the people we're listening to because we get to bring our creativity. We don't even know what those people look like. So we, from their voice, we we make this image of, oh, this must be what they look like. And, and so we become a part of that. Whereas when it's video, it's less that we, there's too much for us. There's almost too much information for us. Not a, And then we don't get to bring our creativity to it. Um, and again, I was remembering, you know, the almost lost art of reading, you know, reading a book that, is actually paper and and ink, you know, it's like, we don't do that much anymore. But I remember as a, as growing up as a kid, those were my, I loved reading because it involved me. I would envision certain things. And then, you know, if you ever got into a book club or we had to do reviews on a, in a class or something about it, 
it was so interesting to hear everyone had a different take. Everyone, the main character looked like this or that or the other thing. And, and we all had this different art. We brought our creativity to it. And that's what I believe is, is really the power of podcasts. It's less technical, right? Because there's no video, there's no multimedia production. It's just people talking. Hmm. But in that sense, it brings us back thousands of years to the traditions of, of oral traditions of, of many of our peoples when they were at that stage. And again, all of our peoples, it just depends on which part of our lineage we tend to connect with. Mm -hmm. That's great. And uh, I definitely encourage people to listen and, and they're available, right? Like you have them posted online where people can just go and listen. Now, what would be the best way for people to find it? Yes. There's a, there's on Apple podcasts, um, the name of my channel is As the Little Crow Flies. So kind of a, you know, as the crow flies, it's supposed to be straight to the point. So it's As the Little Crow Flies, straight talk from indigenous communities. So you can do a search. It's on Apple Podcasts. I also have it on, I believe it's audio because I had some people saying that they don't use, uh, they don't have Apple devices in it. So it was easier for them. So I, I, I put it out on two different channels just to make it more accessible. That's great. And um, yeah. And then you also have a final episode of the podcast series. And also, this is kind of an important part in your dissertation where you bring out some big ideas and you kind of reflect on what this has meant to you and what you've pulled out from it. I wonder if you could just comment a little bit on some of the big ideas that emerged in your listening when you were doing that deep listening. Certainly. Um, and that sixth episode was really from my my chair's idea was that would be uh, so the suggestion was that the the transcripts from the podcast would be like a chapter four or five. Uh, we we really didn't do chapters, but it, as far as the dissertation, that was the data and out there publicly. This would be my analysis, and she says it's important to keep with the feel of the oral traditions, and so you will do that. And then the transcript became my analysis chapter. So looking for the big ideas. Uh, part of it was how I did it is I, I listened to all five again, right before I did that. And so I was, I was looking for, again, not using software to say how many times did these words appear, but I just started recognizing certain things that did appear as a theme through th really through all of them. And the, the major one was the need to listen to our students. We're so often looking for solutions to help our students learn and the people that really know what those solutions are, the students, now, they might not say you need to do this, that, and the other thing. But if we listen, they will tell us what they need. And one of the things I remember from, from Ivy was she was saying her students who are Arapaho were saying, we don't see ourselves in this math that we're doing. We don't see ourselves. What, where are our people? Where are we? Uh, and in answering that question, she took them out onto the the plains and they were searching for uh, teepee circles. And I guess they didn't find those, but they found buffalo jumps. And so they could start talking about their people, where they came from and how math was involved and, and how they did things. And then from there, she developed a, a lesson on, on creating the teepee that connected because the way circular connected pie and, and area and volume and, and all these kind of things. And then engineering, because had they were out on the plains and they, they felt the winds were pretty strong out there. So not only did you have to do this in a certain way, you had to uh, build your teepee in a certain way so it didn't get blown over. And so they, they did some experimenting of that, of where to, you know, where to join the teepee sticks. Should it be at the top or at the bottom, you know, which would give you more space or should, it, you know, and they found about two thirds was about it. But that was from listening. Uh, and I guess that was really the major thing overall. What I learned is is listening to my colleagues, um, that by listening to their stories, how they did things, how they developed their curriculum. Jeffrey was one that uh, in his podcast, he talked about developing uh, mathematical games based on the making of a birch bark canoe the gathering. It was sort of, when do you gather things? How much do you gather? And he had taken some courses on on doing it, uh, bringing games uh, into it. And so he developed that, but it was how he developed it. He says he went to an elder, they have an elder in residence in his college, 
And that elder gave him references to go check here and there and these people to talk to. And and I got thinking, you know, how indigenous research is, is sort of backwards how it's done in the academic world. In the academic world, we first go to the library and we look at the books and we're we're supposed to explore all the data. Whereas in this indigenous method, we go talk to a person that is a repository. They are our library because they've lived the experience and they're connected to the multiple generations. And then they will in turn maybe direct us to that physical library where, where there's books and such that they've read but it was it was the relationality part first, whereas in the Western tradition, we kind of go to let's get the facts and the figures first, and then let's maybe find a few people who kind of know what's going on. So those are the kind of things that to me became the big ideas. And one or the other, because of where these professionals work, was the importance of a mission statement for a college each of their colleges that were serving indigenous communities, they had within their mission statement, the need, the desire, the the goal of incorporating the culture and language of the people. And that thing occurred again and again. And it reminded me of a lot of the work I've done is that while mathematics is is quantitative, we focus on the number part, there, it also highly involves the use of language. And when we use language in a certain way, if we use the language of our learners, it's a lot easier path because they're using a language they're familiar with. And in a way, it, they're familiar with it. If it's English, sometimes in our books, in our ways of teaching, we come up with certain ways of explaining something. But then those words need to sort of be translated, the mathematical concepts into how it's used in everyday life. And, and just an example I have is, is from probability. The way that probability uses the word and and or are the opposite of the way we use it in everyday life. One is in as it's the inclusive or and the exclusive and. Um, and so it's kind of, we use them in English both ways, but here in math, it's got to be this specific way when we're talking probability. And I, I see the difficulty that the students go through. Some of the research I've done in using indigenous languages is when those indigenous languages, when they're being used and being taught and in, ingrained, that when they use words from those languages, like the Maori, in talking about the X and Y axis, they have a fishing culture. And the fishing nets have a, a horizontal component and a vertical component, and they have a Maori word for those two directions. When they incorporated that into how they talk about graphs, students started picking up right away. That's what we're talking about. So using that indigenous language is so, so much more helpful than talking about the abscissa and ordinate and, you know, these, these sort of abstract words that even mathematicians have a hard time with sometimes, but imposing this, this other language on mathematics can be difficult for students who are learning it. So that, that was another theme is that draw from within the culture, from within the language of our students. And it's hard work because it's different for each culture. It's different for each area. And so I can't just write a book that's going to address, you know, a whole state, let alone a whole nation or a whole world. The method is so important of how we develop local curriculum. When we're focusing on trying to make a national curriculum or a statewide curriculum, even that's too broad. We need to focus on what's happening locally. What's the culture, the mix of cultures, uh, what's going to help our students. And we can take a larger curriculum, a national curriculum, and revise it to fit a smaller area, but we have to do that to be successful. We have to know our learners, what languages they are using. We have to speak to them in a way that they naturally understand, and then we'll find success in learning. I've looked at uh, in, in Hawaii and in indigenous cultures throughout the U.S., Whenever they incorporate 
a language program, a native language program, the mathematics will typically follow suit without directly addressing the mathematics, but trying to incorporate the, the native languages into the mathematics. Just that aspect of bringing that language that the students use into the way we talk about mathematics increases math scores, math understanding. So there's there's a powerful part of that that can be done if we just, again, know our students, know who we're, we're working with, and then we will be able to have greater success. And what I'm hearing there too is pushing against any political narrative of going to English only education as the way to be like the most quote unquote rigorous. Yes. Hold hold everybody to this English only standard because that's very rigorous. But it's like, well, are we actually trying to support students to get deep learning? If we want deep learning and deep understanding, then we should actually be connecting it to their culture and their their language. And that's going to make it a deeper learning. And hopefully everybody would be on board with like promoting deeper learning and deeper understanding. Yes. And I guess part of it too is uh, I I did a sabbatical back in 2011, 2012, where I implemented a learning mathematics through robotics. I was in Kazakhstan and I was at a trilingual school. The, the instruction was conducted in Russian, Kazakh, and they were adding English. And so it was in this setting that I learned the, the power of language and the and the weakness of language at the same time. But it was interesting in that setting, it was the students that um, could speak a little bit of both. And a lot of times I was working with Kazakh teachers or Russian speaking teachers. They couldn't speak English or one of the other languages, and I couldn't speak their languages. We would call on the students to translate mm-hmm. for us. And it, it created this really collaborative environment where students and teachers were working together as a team to try to understand each other's languages and from those languages pull out sort of the strengths and the weak, you know, but it, I, I think it was this approach of, we're not just going to take one language can do everything, but we're going to make everyone bilingual or trilingual, give them that freedom to understand things. I was taking Russian classes at the time uh, through the school. Uh, so we were all learners of, of someone else's language Again, the culture, as I've been taught, is always, it's embedded in the languages. So the way we speak about things tell us about the culture. Mm-hmm. And uh, by bringing that aspect into mathematics, it, it just, uh, it allows for great creativity and great learning across the spectrum of our students. Yeah. And if you, again, if you kind of force one language to be dominant, you also create insiders and outsiders by definition. Whereas if you say like, no, we're actually going to embrace it together. You can actually, like you said, you can all be on the same team, like on this, in the same community working towards the same goal. Yes. Thanks so much for sharing about your work. And I'm glad you've been able to do such an innovative uh, dissertation that draws on the indigenous oral tradition. I am curious just briefly, like what do you have next up having completed your, your doctorate, which is a, a big accomplishment and congratulations on that. But is there something you're doing forward with these uh, methodologies or ideas or just what's next for you in your professional work? The method actually was so much fun. It didn't, you know, yes, it was work, but it uh, making podcasts was, once I got through the technical side of it, it really is enjoyable. So I would like to, I, I've got ideas for another one of, of uh, maybe me more talking about my experience with uh, learning quote, disabilities of, of how to find the ability within the disability Things like that, working with students, maybe interviewing others, it's it's really a rich way. So I'd like to continue this. Um, I don't have a specific plan laid out, but that's probably the best thing because in my experience, the best things just sort of happen organically, like this this invitation to come talk with you. I have found that I'm I'm an educator and I'm a community educator, so it's helped me really stick to finding solutions locally, helping people, working with people to find those local solutions multiple places and multiple times, and hopefully maybe developing a paradigm where we that makes it faster to go into a community, find some specifics about that community and, and help them make the revisions that they need to make to 
create an ed- educational system that is inclusive of everybody and is successful for everybody. My guest is Michael Littlecrow from Arizona State University. And uh, Mike, I have a question that I often ask. This is um, from a colleague of mine, Aaron Brackenecki, who used to ask us back in grad school, and I've just been using it because it's fun to hear people's different answers. If you were not in math education, is there some other alternative career that you might imagine for yourself? Or like you said, if you follow things that organically arise, is there some other completely different career that might organically arise that you'd be ex- excited about? Like I, I was thinking, I, lo- I love that last question. Um, I would become a Buddhist monk. Uh, and the connection there is that really math education is about human development. And in my study of mathematics, what I found is that mathematics for- forces you to focus, to concentrate on what you're doing. And then that's where the understanding comes. Uh, a Buddhist monk is teaching meditation, which is learning to concentrate and focus your attention within yourself to find your greatest uh, assets, to find your happiness. And so in that progress, I, I see it not necessarily as different, but maybe more out there. As a math educator, I tell my students, yes, I'm here really for the human development part, but I'm also here to teach you math. It'd be nice to be in a career where all I'm saying is I'm here to help you develop as a human being, take the uh, the math part away. And part of this is also uh, ties back to podcasts. I li- I've been listening for years to a podcast by um, a John Jeffrey. He's uh, a Buddhist monk in Southern California, trained in Thailand, but he's an American educator who became a monk. Uh, and I listen to this day, uh, his podcasts are 15 to 20 minutes and they're, they're about Dharma, about life. And, uh, so that I see as a, as a very nice future of just helping people become the best human they can become. Mm. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing, uh, your perspective and your wisdom with us today. And it was really great talking to you, Mike. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you, Sam.